Welcome. Uh, I'm Andy Murray, and as the Exec Director of the Major Projects Association, it's my pleasure to introduce today's topic of leading major projects. In conjunction with Bentley Systems, this is the second in a series of joint webinars between the government's Infrastructure and Projects Authority and the Major Projects Association. For those unfamiliar with the association, we are, are a membership body with a purpose to improve the initiation and delivery of major projects through the interaction of members in sharing experience, knowledge, research and ideas. We have around 100 member organisations coming from government, industry, funders, advisors and academia with individuals from the spectrum of professions required for successful projects. So that's policy, law, commercial, finance, engineering, technology and project management to name some. Today's topic of leading major projects has a particular focus on the role of the senior responsible owner or SRO. I first heard the term SRO around the turn of the millennium. It was used as a descriptive label, independent of job title or grade, to mean the most senior individual responsible, and I guess we can read accountable for that, for an initiative on behalf of a board, executive team or minister. A little while later in 2000, the term appeared in a government report regarding modernising government. Better SROs was one of 10 key areas the report focused on for improving large scale change and transformation. To my knowledge, it was the first time the role was properly defined in a project or program context. Much of what's in place today regarding leading major projects can be traced back to that report. I don't believe the responsibilities of the role has changed significantly since, but I suspect that the expectations and ambiguities of major projects has, making the role even more challenging. I'm sure we'll hear more about this from our speakers during today's webinar. That's all from me, so I'd like to hand over to our MC for this afternoon, Gabriella Bosman. Gabriella has been a project delivery advisor in the Infrastructure and Projects Authority since May 2019, with a focus area including the EU transition portfolio of change programs and border transformation. With experience in the public, private and third sectors internationally, Gabriella uh, has program and project management roles that have taken her around the world and continue to drive her towards UK government and international development goals, placing people and authentic relationships at the centre. Gabriella, over to you. Thank you, Andy. And, and what great insight around the genesis of the role of the SRO. Much more to come on that over the course of our event today. As Andy mentioned, my name is Gabriella and I work for the Infrastructure and Projects Authority um, in government, which, which reports to the Cabinet Office and the Treasury. And I consists of project delivery experts from various fields who seek to advise and support the delivery of projects across UK government. More information on our work can be found on the website. So we had over 1,300 people subscribe to this event. So despite only seeing five of us on this screen today, we promise there are more people engaged in this conversation. And so you are aware, we are recording the event for later sharing. So today we will have three short presentations from our speakers, followed by a Q&A. I invite you to use a phone or mobile to log into Mentimeter to share and upvote any questions and for the Q&A section of this event. I would now like to introduce the first speaker and panellist for today. She has been the Director for the Function, Profession and Standards in the IPA since last year and leads work on the developing project delivery standards and capability across UK government. Fiona was previously Chief Portfolio Office for the Home Office, leading work on strategic investment, overseeing delivery of the departmental project portfolio and building skills and capability as a departmental head of profession for project delivery, including a stint at acting Director General. Over her career, Fiona has led a range of major projects in tech, shared services, development and business transformation in the home affairs, criminal justice and mental health arenas. Without further ado, over to you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriella. And, and thank you for that introduction. So it's fantastic to be here today and just a shame that I can't see you all in person. Um, as Andy said, it's 20 years since the emergence of the SRO concept in the UK government. So I thought it would be interesting really to, to reflect on how thinking about major projects has developed over that time and, and to some extent what we've learned as a result. So the, the SRO, interesting concept, emerged around the 2000s. I think it was around a little bit before 2000, but it certainly turns up in this publication in 2000 in what was called the McCartney Report. 
um, unofficially at least. And um, the idea grew out really out of IT projects and set out in this particular publication with a description, description of the SRO, which I think we would all actually recognize today. In fact, this you can still find this on the web. And it's really quite an interesting document in terms of how much still remains true. Um, and I vaguely remember it. Um, it was a place where some really useful things were set out. So the, the key point really was, you know, the idea of a single senior individual with overall responsibility for the delivery of project objectives and benefits, somebody in charge. And the concept got traction um, really quite quickly, first of all in IT projects, which is where I remember it first, and then more widely. Some of it worked. Um, you know, I remember the idea really getting traction. I remember, you know, SROs turning up and suddenly there was somebody who was clearly responsible and that was great. I, as a programme director, had in fact three joint SROs, which you probably wouldn't have today, working together on a project. They were excellent. They were engaged. They did exactly what you would want an SRO to do. Sometimes it didn't. Um, I knew an SRO who was responsible for 14 projects, really quite big ones. Um, too often, sometimes, it became a bit of a badge rather than a genuine role. But towards the end of that period, I also became an SRO and for a major project. And I started to understand some of the challenges involved in doing the job properly. And also, I found out that there wasn't much out there by way of guidance or training beyond the basics of some basic SRO induction, PRINCE2 and MSP. And that basically I found as an SRO, you were sort of having to make things up as you went along. So more to do. And then along came the change of government in 2010 and Francis Maud absolutely determined to transform the delivery of government projects. And, and with that, a new focus on accountability, not just about having somebody in charge, but somebody being accountable to the accounting officer, to ministers, to parliament. And in 2014, the Osmo other new rules were changed, which governed the relationship between civil servants and parliament. And setting out very clearly the SRO having a specific and direct personal accountability to parliament. But alongside that, you also saw some other changes. So a big focus also on, on stronger leadership. And in particular, I think the seminal thing that came out around them was the major project leadership academy established in 2012. And I, I would say the single most powerful intervention in transforming major projects, certainly major projects leadership in government. I was really fortunate because I was fortunate enough to go on a, a, an early cohort of the MPLA. Um, and, and I can say from personal experience, it was genuinely transformative. I learned that the fact that there were difficult messaging challenges on, on my major projects was not that I wasn't applying prints too hard enough. It was that major projects were inherently challenging. They're complex and messy and ambiguous, and that leading them wasn't just about process and technical knowledge and commercial knowledge, but also about self-awareness and resilience and adaption and inclusive leadership and about leading temporary organizations and managing the wider operating environment. And as more major projects leaders completed the MPLA, and we've got uh, pretty much around 500 graduates now across the government, you saw not just growth of a community of practice, but also a change in the language of major project delivery in government. And alongside that, a new confidence and assertiveness in SROs. But despite that, there were other things as well. So getting the basics right, it became increasingly clear that, in fact, if SROs were understanding their role better, the rest of the operating environment didn't always share that understanding. And that SROs were still being asked to take on roles that were basically, sometimes, undeliverable. Um, frankly, it's no good having accountability if there's no clarity on the relationship between other players, ministers, accounting officers, project directors, and everybody not everybody understands those roles. It's no good being an SRO if you don't have the time or the levers to do the job, if you don't know what you're doing, or if you're expected to keep on moving jobs in order to progress rather than see the project through. So increasingly over the last few years, the focus has been on really turning to 
how you can make sure that the SRO and the project are set up for success on, on setting out the basics, if you like, and making sure they're in place. Giving more SROs really the teeth to have the argument up front before they agree their appointment letters about what they need in order for them and the project to succeed. And alongside that, um, as well as the focus on the basics, we also wanted really to capture some of the learning from SROs from, from the MPLA. And rather brilliantly, in 20, around 2019, 2018, 2019, a bunch of SROs came together with the IPA uh, to develop a little handbook um, by SROs for SROs, which was designed originally for transformation SROs, but actually when you read it, I think it is relevant to pretty much any major project. And the focus of it is purely behavioural, you know, about the delicate balancing act the SRO's got to achieve, balancing control and empowerment, navigating complex stakeholder structures, visionary leadership, shaping the culture of the project, managing the interaction with the operating environment, and above all, the importance of authentic leadership, which I think brings us to, to where we are now. So people and behaviour. And if the last decade has really taught us anything, and certainly experience of the pandemic over the last six months has taught us, it's that yes, major project leadership involves responsibility and accountability. And yes, it does require professional expertise and experience. And yes, it needs a strong understanding actually of technical and commercial leadership and how projects really tick. And yes, it needs the basic conditions, the hygiene factors for success to be in place. But I think we've also learned that a key part of the SRO's professional, professional expertise and experience is, is around people and behaviours and how they come together in order to deliver projects successfully. So people, principles and performance. But I'd argue people first and foremost. So looking ahead, we're now in a world where, you know, we've, I think we've seen a real shift in thinking about major projects leadership over the last two decades. Looking ahead then, what else do we need to think about for the next decade? How can we build on what we've learned and use it to deliver projects better and faster and greener in future? So I think you know we're at a point where major projects leadership has never been more important. Whether you're involved in leading projects in response to the pandemic or huge work ahead in terms of mobilizing the economy. There's, there's a lot more I think we've got to learn and there's never been a more important time I'd argue to do so. So I think today is fantastically timed. I think it will be a great conversation and I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Fiona. Um, it's especially interesting to hear about the importance of leadership and behaviours for the role of the SROs, which leads us quite nicely onto our next speaker for today. But just before we go on to Kevin's presentation, just a reminder to you all to pose questions on Mentimeter with the code 83351678. Seven. Now that's eight three three five one six seven. We look forward to um, addressing some of those questions that may have cropped up after these presentations um, in the Q and A later on. So now, Kevin Murphy is responsible for delivering fibre and network infrastructure to our residential business customers. I can almost hear the E's and R's <laughs> through the screen. Um, Kevin started his career at Ericsson before joining the startup cable TV industry as it expanded in Britain. As director of TV and media for NTL, he was responsible for delivering the world's first digital cable TV se service, Europe's first video on demand service, and the UK's very first broadband network. Kevin next came to BT, where he was responsible for Britain's network operations. He became Br BT's director of London 2012 operations and was responsible for the award-winning delivery of network, TV, voice and web services for the London Olympic and Paralympic Games. Kevin joined OpenReach in 2016 and leads 12,000 OpenReach employees and 10,000 contractor partners to build fibre networks for business customers, manage national infrastructure and build new full fibre networks to 20 million homes and businesses across the UK. Over to you, Kevin. 
Brilliant, and thank you, Gabriella. And uh, if anybody's got any problems with their broadband, um, I'm your man. Um, so picking up uh, from Fiona and the art of brilliance, um, whilst I'm the MD for fibre and network delivery, I guess I'm also the SRO uh, for the project as well. And I'd like to take a few minutes uh, this afternoon to talk to you about some of the leadership and cultural lessons in building one of the largest infrastructure programs happening in the UK right now. And that's the full fibre telecoms network across the UK. Um, it's great to meet so many of you here virtually, and I'm proud to think that events like these are made possible largely by the telecom networks that we have built across the UK. Openreach build and look after the local access network, which runs from the local telephone exchange to nearby homes and businesses. Right now, it's a mixture of copper and fibre networks, and we are the people who look after the 100,000 green street cabinets and the nearly 5 million telegraph poles that you see dotted around the country. You'll, you'll also likely notice some of our 35,000 people uh, moving around the UK in one of the largest fleets of 27,000 vans. We're a massive company with 5 billion in revenues, bigger than most F, uh, FTSE 100 companies. And we wholesale to over 650 communication providers who continue to con connect their customers. So that's people like Sky, TalkTalk, Talk, Vodafone and BT use our network to, to provide the services to their customers. We're now on a mission to build a new full fiber local access network so everyone in the UK can get access to ultra fast connections. So that's one gigabit services. And a full fiber network, basically what does that mean? It means that we're rewiring the UK telecom network over the next decade. So essentially we're connecting a strand of glass fiber optic cable from the local telephone exchange and threading it through the ducts and the poles to every home and business across the country. So when you're out and about, look up at the telegraph poles if you have them in your area. All those cables you see running into people's houses and flats, there's, that's what we're replacing. And we all know personally the increasing demand for higher broadband speeds, taking us from megabits to gigabits. This, this will totally transform the way we live and the way we do business, especially given the unprecedented economic uncertainty we're facing today. Nationwide, full fibre can reinvigorate the UK and be a crucial platform for our economic recovery. Full fibre will boost the UK recovery productivity by 59 billion, uh, bringing up to half a million people back into the workforce. And also it's massively green slashing carbon emissions from commuting, and we're all, uh, most of us, enjoying working from home at the moment. We have a huge ambition in Openreach to be the UK's largest full fibre provider, reaching 20 million homes and businesses by the mid to late 2020s. And in this £12 billion programme so far, we've built nearly 10% of the country with 3.4 million homes passed, and we have massive plans to accelerate. So with a multi-billion pound program, 35,000 people, 10,000 contractors, what are some of the leadership lessons as we start this major project? Well, the first thing that I like to do is to take the lessons from the past, but really to set up our leadership from the future. Now, the copper network was built over the last 100 years, and the conditions were very different, different than what we have today, mainly by a government public company, the GPO. Uh, the roads were dug up, private lands crossed, and homes were entered as part of the national good. Today, we are one of several private companies competing to roll out fibre. We've got way leaves, traffic permissions to deal with as well. And we're trying to do this within a decade. In fact, most and the bulk of this work to be done over the, by the middle of the decade. Now, there's no way those men, and they were probably mainly men, could have imagined the technology and the services that they unleashed when they thought it was a telex or basic telephone service. In that same way, we look at the project not as a technology and infrastructure project. We lead the project from the future, a future that the Infrastructure Client Group and the Institute of Civil Engineers recently described as flourishing systems. 
this complex machine of infrastructure in the built environment that we interact with every day. We are building the nervous system that will connect people, machines, infrastructure, societies, both national and international. And when we set our targets, we think of that outcome. Um, so, as, as Gabriella mentioned, uh, London 2012, uh, what has that got to do with building fibre networks in the 2020s? Well, as the operations director for BT, uh, connecting all the TV and voice uh, and web services for the games, one of my biggest lessons was the creation of self-managing teams and servant leadership. Initially, the organization was set up in siloed functions, so we had sport, timing, technology, logistics, infrastructure, et cetera. But in 2011, there was a process called venueization, where all these functions reset into venue-based teams, so like the stadium or the velodrome, et cetera. And they had a very clear purpose. On the 27th of July, 2012, at 9 p.m., there was gonna be an opening ceremony one way or the other. And then after the opening ceremony, there was the greatest show on earth was going to happen. So there's a very, very clear purpose. I also learned that the delivery, performance and brand of the BT uh, of the business lay in the hands of the engineers in the venues. And there was very little I could do other than to serve those people and make their purpose a reality. And since joining OpenReach, I've taken this purpose-led, self-managed team philosophy into the business. And I've set up our engineers into 214 patches where the team own, cherish, and deliver for our customers and the local, local communities we serve. We have seen our people engagement shift from 60% engaged to over 80% in the last four years. Against international benchmarks of equivalent utility companies, it's roughly about 68. So we're delighted with that. And also we're delighted to be recognized as one of the 25 best companies to work for by the times this year. So leadership, engagement, and communication with the workforce is crucial. When you create and empower teams, the, fleet, the free flow of information, support, clearing barriers, serving the people is essential. Last year, we deployed Workplace into the group. This is actually made by Facebook, uh, and it, it behaves like Facebook, for, but in the business secure environment. And it has been remarkable to see the creation of teams, sharing best practices, asking for help, of course, sharing moans and groans, and creating a healthy, transparent communication. As a leader, it's really important to play, pay co close attention to the sentiment of the business. And I spend a lot of time watching and listening and seeing what's going on. And also, though, to meet the teams on the ground uh, when it was socially uh, distant, okay to do so, um, but really importantly, to break down the hierarchical power structure. I often suffer from the watermelon syndrome. Uh, by the time I get told about something, it looks very green on the outside, but really it's deep red on the inside. So speaking and listening to people is both a great way to know the truth on delivery, but also, if I do it, then the middle managers will do it too. So, and the results are outstanding. Our net promoter score, for example, on business connectivity went from a dire minus 100 four years ago, and it's now setting at plus 60. Now, as Fiona said, uh, a bit of chaos is to be expected, and we had that really at the very start of the project. As this is a private company investing in a very competitive environment with government and regulatory pressures, it's important to us to be fast out of the traps. And in that initial phase, speed was really important. So when you have a situation when time cost quality triangle is spinning around as, as crazy as anything, sometimes it's important to nail just one. Now, I know the project management books say two, but before you get there, choose one. And we chose time for a fast start. And yes, it was chaotic. We made mistakes. We had to go back and fix things later. But we learned loads. And this gave us the momentum to accelerate. In 2018, we covered 600,000 homes passed. In 2019, it was 1.2 million. And we doubled it again to over 2 million this year with an ambition to get up to 3 million homes passed. Now, you can't do this with post-it notes. 
So we have nailed our mast to structure, methods, and especially data and the flow of data. We've accelerated the build, hit all our milestones, and dropped the cost to the low end of the business case and benchmarks very strongly against European rollouts. But even with all the best laid plans, as a leader, you need to be able to adapt and quickly. With the tragedy that is COVID, we had the sudden shift of demand onto working from home, but also we stepped up to the connection requirements for our UK critical national infrastructure, especially the Nightingale hospitals. We also had terrible times with uh, floods, electrical storms. You can see the top of a telegraph pole on fire after being hit by lightning and even abuse from a very small min minority on 5G conspiracy theories. Despite all that, the purpose, culture, and engagement of the teams across OpenReach have continued to deliver awesome results. And as the FTTP build ex accelerated, the team all know what needs to be done. And I'd be very happy to take any questions at the end. Back to you, Gabriella. Thank you for your presentation, Kevin. I'm sure we'll have a plethora of questions um, that draw on your experiences, especially on culture and what sounds like what is a, a mammoth task, um, which leads us perfectly onto our next speaker for today. Uh, Rosanna Laws is a chartered surveyor and responsible for the delivery of development programs on Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, one of the largest and highest profile urban regeneration projects in the UK and in fact, in Europe. Um, the focus is to deliver a lasting legacy of the 2012 Games and new neighbourhoods, providing a mix of residential, commercial and social infrastructure, equating to a gross development value of £3.3 billion. Um, she's also the senior responsible owner officer rather for East Bank, the new creative and education hub with Sadler's Wells, UAL's London College of Fashion, University College London, BBC, um, and one of my personal favourites, the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, this £1.1 billion pound project will deliver 2,500 jobs and attract 1.5 million additional visitors and generate £1.2 million pounds of economic benefit to London and the UK. She has worked on the Olympic 2012 um, programme since 2004 also supporting the bid team, then led the program to acquire the 650 acres of land through two compulsory purchase orders, the largest of their time, and led the legacy master plans to support the bid and Olympic Paralympic Games planning applications. Prior to that, she spent seven years working in private practice. Without further ado, over to you, Rosanna. Thank you. Hi, Gabriella. Thank you very much. And hello to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to focus in particular uh, on East Bank, uh, which is an incredibly exciting program that um, brings with it many, many challenges. So I'm going to focus a little bit and touch on um, a lot of uh, perhaps uh, some of uh, Fiona's observations, particularly around process. Um, but I'm also going to spend a little bit of time on people. I think, um, as Fiona said, people are incredibly important uh, to running major programmes. I'll also touch on the challenges um, and some of that chaos uh, that was touched on earlier by, by Kevin. Um, and then finally, I'm going to sum up with some personal reflections. Um, and again, delighted to take questions at the end. So, um, as Gabriella noted in, in, in my introduction, we're a mayoral development corporation and we were established um, one of the first of its kind um, in the UK, but primarily with a focus on ensuring that uh, we deliver the benefits of the uh, vast investment that uh, London received to host the 2012 Games. So our mission statement really is about creating a once in a lifetime opportunity um, to ensure that the 2012 games and the creation of the park, the Olympic Park, we develop a dynamic new heart for East London, creating opportunities for local people, driving innovation and growth in London and in the UK. So the reason um, for the, the bid, of course, was really about the regeneration. Of course, it was a fabulous uh, opportunity to present a, a major event, but also a significant six weeks of sport. Uh, the focus in particular has had to be on the regeneration of the park and how do you translate that mission statements into, into your projects. So immediately after 2012 um, the vision for uh, East Bank was really just an apple um, of the then mayor's eye um, Boris Johnson our, our, our Prime Minister 
So the focus really around the park had been largely around residential and employment-led uh, opportunities. So we set about um, exploring what we could do differently on the park, how we could up our game. Um, and we were aware of and had invested really quite significantly in um, opportunities around education, opportunities around um, the investment in tech. A lot of um, Kevin's slides earlier, um, I think, present some of the early investments that you had seen. So our focus really was to ensure that um, how do we um, take this opportunity where we've had billions of eyeballs um, on London and in particular on East London and put it on the map. So born from that really through conversations with our board and with the then mayor, um, the vision for East Bank was, was born. I think the vision um, and vision particularly on major projects um, is incredibly important. Um, it's incredibly important to both sell your vision um, but also build the opportunity and build the benefits that uh, that, that program can that, that program can generate. So um, the focus in particular um, looked at um, where we would um, present and place um, East Bank, um, and we sought to do that really at the centre of uh, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. It really is quite a busy slide, but it does present to you some of the uh, the challenges, but equally some of the opportunities. Um, the focus um, of East Bank was really around, centred around two sites. Um, we are currently in the process of uh, developing over a million square feet of um, new academic, cultural and education um, opportunities um, on the park. So the challenge then in selling that vision, and um, particularly in funding that vision, was really um, setting out what are strategic objectives. So what would the strategic approach be? And what would the benefits of the programme be? So the challenge was to create a vision, but also create and um, just really focus on what those benefits were. So it really was about the transformation of the place. And it was about collaboration both with the institutions that were coming to the park, but also about the people. And it was also a new opportunity for us to really imagine new ways of practice. Um, how could we challenge ourselves? How could we uh, nurture opportunity at scale? So we thought about doing that, um, both through some of our current programmes, but also through East Bank. So the benefits of um, East Bank, as Gabriella set out um, at, at the outset, are really, really quite significant. Um, but they do come with really quite some significant challenges. So as we are a mayoral development corporation, uh, we are responsible to uh, the mayor of London. Uh, we've also do, um, responsible to the stakeholders um, who are delivering this program with us. But equally, we're also responsible to government. So it's, it's created really quite a very, very complex environment. And navigating and working through that complex environment is really, really challenging, but also quite, quite a privilege. And then we had to focus in particular on progressing the full business case, a fun business case to, uh, to government for, for support. And articulating the vision, articulating the benefits, and really pulling that business case and the economic plan together, um, as well as pulling together all those stakeholders uh, for local authority, uh, local communities, and are also the adjoining landowners. It really has taken us about four years, uh, two and a half to three years to get through to outline business case, four years to get through to full business case, and we are now on site. So, um, moving on to so some of our achievements to date. Now, this, again, really quite a busy slide, but we do report um, on an annual basis, uh, both to our local residents, local communities, the mayor, but also to, to government. And the um, opportunity here for our East Bank partners was really to get together to collaborate. And you might ask, how do you pull a program together with the VNA? Sadler's Wells, UAL, the BBC and UCL and encourage those institutions who are largely academics and athletes um, to collaborate together. The reality of it was that many of these institutions already undertook really quite extensive collaboration together through research and academic programmes, um, through curatorial, 
curatorial programmes. But it was about sitting with those institutions and setting down and articulating the opportunities, the scale of the opportunities, and really looking at why these institutions wanted to come to Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. So we set about looking at, um, so you might ask, how did the VNA and all of these institutions come to, 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 to be part of the programme? So we were aware of some of their requirements in the market. Uh, UCL, um, based in Bloomsbury, have a significant uh, footprint in Bloomsbury, but also keen and eager to, to extend in order to, to maintain their platform um, on the world um, academic stage. Um, the BBC um, were one of the last parties to the table, but again, they're relocating their studios from Maida Vale to uh, the Olympic Park. Um, UAL are relocating um, four of their coll colleges uh, into one location. So again, we are aware of that requirement um, in the market. As with Sadler's Wells, they were looking for a smaller scale um, theatre um, and um, dance studio in order to ensure that they could continue to position themselves as one of the leader, leading contemporary dance uh, studios and, and brands in the world, and in particular compete um, on the European stage. So these are just some of the images of um, the scheme that we have on site. So top left-hand side, the BBC, and to the right, uh, we have um, half a million square feet um, of phase one uh, UCL. So that master plan can accommodate another one and a half million square feet of new academic space. So our first phase is up and we will begin, UCL will begin occupation uh, towards the end of 2022. Moving clockwise to the right, we've got the VNA's um, new museum uh, where it'll be about a 60,000 square meter, uh, 6,000 square meter museum um, delivering really quite significant gallery space. So the ambition really is to take a lot of the blockbuster um, exhibitions that they have at Great Exhibition Road and bring them down here to East London. And Sadler's Wells, a new 500 seat uh, auditorium with Dance Academy. And on the left then, um, uh, well, this left on the bottom is the new uh, UAL uh, campus. So, we'd, so Kevin touched earlier on um, some of the tech investments that um, uh, the games brought to, to the park. And here East is an example of that. It's, it's, it's a new innovation tech and digital cluster. And it was an opportunity um, for uh, the VNA to explore the relocation of their reserve um, collection and research centre from Blythe House um, in Kensington uh, down to the park so that it was proximate to their new museum. Um, on the part. Now, this is just an example of some of the other complexities that you can get with major programs. So we started with a plan A and the images that I showed you earlier were plan are, are now plan B. But of course, we did have significant change. Um, some of that change would have been with uh, the VNA um, introducing the opportunity to bring their reserve collection uh, to the park. So moving on to complexities, um, so establishing the vision um, and engaging and citing partners really at the outset um, is incredibly important and reimagining that vision or reminding and reinforcing that is, is, is really incredibly important. I've touched on benefits. I think one of the main complexities that I've experienced on this program is um, trying to establish a coalition of interests whereby all of these institutions could move along at the same pace, make timely decisions at the same pace, so that the programme didn't suffer from, let's say, the tardiness of one particular institution's um, uh, decision-making. So multiple partners and multiple funding sources. So again, a lot of our stakeholders and partners here are funders as, as well as end, end providers, as our government, as is the mayor. And working alongside all of these um, funders, keeping them up to date, again, is, is incredibly important. And the importance really of good governance structures, I just really can't emphasize, emphasize enough. Uh, the other challenge we had really was um, entering into bilateral um, legal agreements with all of these institutions. Um, and they, of course, typically none of these uh, legal agreements happened at the same time. Um, and we had to do that really ahead of the FBC to, um, in, to really instill um, 
confidence in government to support the programme, confidence in the mayor, and indeed confidence of all of the other um, partners to, to continue to, to move along. Um, again, risks, risks are um, ever-present, but the, the fundamental important thing really is to, to focus on mitigation and mitigating those risks and putting risks where they're best placed to be managed. Um, that's not an easy task, um, but um, one that is uh, really, really incredibly important, particularly on major instruction programmes. Building a team and relationships, um, again, is, is, is fundamentally important. So working alongside your team, spending time with your team, and as Kevin said earlier, listening to your, to your team and listening to your stakeholders and, and just always, always being engaged. I mentioned earlier that our brief changed. Um, so we've moved from a plan A now to a plan B, and thankfully we are now on site. During that process, of course, we had some political change and we had to, as I said, reset the programme. And of course, with that political change, you have to reset, reset some of your teams as well and building that team back up when there's a shock and when there, there is change on a programme is, is very, very important. We didn't have Brexit, nor did we have COVID-19 on our risk register. Um, um, I think we'd all be in different jobs if we could, um, if we had crystal balls. Um, but nevertheless, again, managing all of those challenges and how do you how do you focus, refocus your team and refocus the program uh, to get through all of that? People, um, people are uh, fundamentally um, so so important to your program. So relationships are so essential. Um, and then your ability to tune into uh, the political mood, um, but both with your partners, but also local politics. And indeed, if there is that route back into government through, through to your minister and national politics, again, really very, very important. Diplomatic at all times. Um, and you have to be, uh, have to challenge and hold everyone to account. And fostering a collaborative um, culture across the program, again, incredibly important. And if things are not going as quite as the culture had, had, had set out to do, you've got to call it out and you've got to make some of those changes. I would say diversity in your teams is really important. Group think not good. Um, and again, just really listen, listen and focus um, and listen to sometimes some of the quieter individuals within your team. Just listen to and see what they, they have to say. Decisive decision making. You know how do you how do you put um, timely decision processes in place to ensure that that people are engaged, that stakeholders are taking decisions. And again, as Kevin noted earlier, program was one of his keys. Again, program was one of mine. Um, and again, I I enforced um, timely decision making milestones on our partners to ensure that we could we could progress. Resilient teams, um, emotional resilience, um, incredibly important both for yourself and also for your team. Um, constructive challenge and assurance, um, program assurance, project assurance, again, is very important, but also your reassurance of your team and, and of your program. Allowing space to innovate, this is a tricky one, but incredibly important. Um, um, just do try and leave some space for that. So some reflections, um, I sometimes um, sort of compare being an SRO on a program as being the chief executive of a major program inside your organisation and that in itself can bring some challenges. Um, you end up being the strategist, uh, the leader, uh, the problem solver, the diplomat, uh, the person who's over the detail, but also, or well, across the detail but also doing a lot of horizon scanning, looking out for the next challenge, looking out for what's going to come over the horizon at you. Building relationships, but also establishing that goodwill. Goodwill will stand you in good stead. Um, and you know, your integrity as, 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 as an individual and as a leader um, is incredibly um, important. When it goes wrong and you have to move on to a plan B, uh, you've got to find the solution, but you've got to find the solution with your team uh, your team can help carry you carry you on that journey. Um, I found that you've had to be fearless um, and determined and your own personal resilience um, is incredibly important. It's got to be finely tuned at, at all time. You've got to find ways of replenishing that resilience and, and keeping going. Holding all to account, um, again, 
holding those ministers to account, politicians to account, um, your board or whomever or stakeholders across across your programme. That's for you to do, and that can be incredibly challenging. There's a lot of learning to do in that space. And it can be a pretty lonely space, um, but um, it's certainly worth, worth that challenge. Change is ever certain. Um, prepare for it. Um, and again, that will be in the res both in the resilience of your team, your the competency you, 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 you have of that team, your risk registers, your mitigation plans, and all of that, your processes as well as your people are, again, important. Again, leadership of yourself and your, as I said, your own personal integrity, um, in very important. Um, so again, consider everything from all partners' perspectives. You know, we run um, heat maps, um, both for the program itself, but also for each of our stakeholders. So we get together on a regular basis and present what's worrying us. Um, there will be many other influencing factors outside of your immediate environment that you can't control. You could, you can get curveballs, and they will come. Um, and that engagement with your stakeholders um, will be very, very important. And finally, I'll just end by um, saying you've got to maintain an objective mind all the time. Just focus um, both on the current and, and on the future and be objective when it comes to solving those problems and challenges. Thank you. And back to Gabriella. Thank you so much for your presentation, Rosanna. Some really rich insights here. I look forward to talking more to the point of ensuring business case benefits are realised too, because that was quite an interesting um, point that you made there. So we are now moving to the part I'm sure many of you in our audience have been waiting for. Um, if I can now invite the speakers to join us um, with their videos again, we will now begin um, the Q&A section of today's event. Um, and to our audience, it is not too late to submit and upvote questions on Mentimeter, so please do continue to do so as we talk to the points that you raise in this part of the event. So, panellists, let's start with the question right at the top of our Mentimeter polling, which is probably potentially the most challenging one will be posed today. Uh, but the first question we have here is, what has been the most challenging thing you've experienced as an SRO around behaviours, and how did you overcome it? So I will begin that with Kevin, if you'd like to start answering that question. Thank you. Um, I'll be I'll be quick on this one. I think behaviours when I joined BT, when I joined it was a really toxic uh, behaviour and culture, but it was driven from performance management and a real, almost a industrialised performance management, uh, three strikes and you're out and that sort of thing. Uh, the way I dealt with it was I switched it off. Um, and the managers hated it. Um, they all really were worried about how they would manage because it was a big command and control environment. But, um, you know, say two, three years later, trust and power has worn out. Apologies, it, it slightly cut off there, but I think I got the, the gist of your statement there about nipping it in the bud. Um, and I'd like to perhaps pose the same question um, to Rosanna, re-behaviours um, and challenging those within um, delivery of, in your um, respective project. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tricky one. I think starting the programme as you mean to go on and putting some um, discipline um, around what you think the appropriate practices are for your program, I think is important. I think the most challenging area that I had was really across our stakeholder group. Um, again, you can't control some of those behaviours, but you can certainly influence them. Um, you're not responsible for those, or, or, um, those the behaviours of some of those external um, stakeholder groups, but you've got to try and influence them. I think when challenges arise, I think unfortunately you've, you've got to step in, you've got to call it out. Um, and many times it may be endemic within some organizations or institutions. Um, and it may be that some of those institutions don't quite appreciate that these challenges exist. So I think it's important to be brave and step in and, 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 and challenge unbecoming behaviors because your program will suffer. 
No, that's that's it's really great insight there, especially around speaking to the parts within your team that need to be um, challenged as well, which actually quite nicely leads us on um, to the next question that has been posed on Mentimeter, um, which speaks to the role of program managers, as we have a diversity of people um, that have joined us um, in today's event. So one of the questions which I'd like to first pose to Fiona is, um, what is one thing that SROs wish their program managers would A, do more of, and B, do less of best to support them? And this is from a, pro a program manager and who is supporting, of course, an SRO. Fiona, if you can answer that one. Yes, happily. And so I think the thing most SROs would like program directors to do more of is actually talk to them, build that really strong relationship, and not be afraid to call it as it is. So one of the things that used to really worry me as an SRO is when I thought people were not telling me stuff because they were scared because it was bad news. So the thing I always wanted to do is create a culture where people could say, you know, I said, I'd always rather know first. I'd much rather know before the permanent secretary's on the phone. Please talk to me. Please tell it like it is. Um, so that to me is the the epitome of the relationship between the SRO and programme director is openness and transparency and a feeling of mutual trust and respect. That's really key. Do less of is harder. Um, I suppose it's the counterpart to that. Do less of, of kind of feeling they have to manage things and, you know, not share them. Um, but, yeah, I think openness and transparency in the relationship is really, really key. No, it's brilliant. And, and, and to that point, actually, it'd be quite interesting to hear how do we ensure that such messages of um, empowerment and trust are communicated throughout the hierarchy. So we've spoken to the role of um, the project direct, the program director, rather, sorry, um, and the SRO. How do you make sure that that um, trickles down? Perhaps, Fiona, again, for you to start and then we can move to our other panellists. It is, I mean, it is about leadership and it is about how you act as a leader and the culture and the climate you set in your project right from the start. Um, when I started, uh, first job as an SRO, um, a very experienced old hand said, we should have a project charter. He was a stakeholder, but he said, we sh you should have a project charter. And I went, why? And he said, no, you should. Write down how you expect to behave and then make sure that that is in every single project board set of papers. Um, and it set out, this is how we will behave. This, these are our values. This is what we're trying to do. This is how we're going to be. And he was right. And when the times were good, you didn't need it. When the times were bad, we found ourselves coming back to it. But it's, it's all about setting that frame and the messaging and then living that experience as a leader. No, brilliant. And Kevin, I, I might want to ask you that question around how you make sure that that trickles down. An organisation of your, of your size, um, overseeing as many people as you do, how do you make sure that culture of empower, empowerment and trust and transparency is, pervades every part of the organisation, especially in one of your size? Yeah, well, and hopefully my audio is okay, uh, Gabriella. The you know we, we spent a lot of time, and in fact, brought in an external consultancy called Kin and Co uh, to help us define the cultural principles for the project. Uh, but one of the biggest things that um, they advised us was to co-create the principles. So we actually spoke to nearly three thousand people. Um, across the, the organization, and we came up with the principles. They were on my slides, but I didn't say it there. It's, if they are, own it, be open, mm -hmm. be part of it, think impact. And those four principles, when we launched them, mm -hmm. pretty much everyone mm had -hmm. seen it, felt part of it. So they, they, they now are used right through all the different communications that we have. Um, and again, they've actually landed very well. That's that's brilliant, and and I suppose one thing that we can sort of pull pull from that, which would be quite interesting to understand from your perspective too, Rosanna, is what are those effective levers influencing behaviours and cultures across the organisation? So we've already heard Kevin speak to the point of making sure that it is a collaborative um, uh, activity that's facilitated, so that it, it does pervade all parts of the organisation. What do you see as an as an SRO of a program of your side, Rosanna, um, as an effective lever in influencing behaviours? Um, within your organisation? Um, 
I think both within and outside of the organisation, I probably spend more time levering, um, using levers to influence externally than I do internally. I think, as Kevin said, setting up, you know, um, some really important um, uh, a, a charter, or sorry, as, as Fiona said, is, is really important. So ours is care. So it's about collaboration, ambition, responsibility, and excellence. And it's really we've set up, sought to set up a, a, a culture of no surprises and just a really trusting, open culture. So if you've got any problems, you must come and you know express um, some of those challenges. I mean, in terms of sort of levers externally, I mean, I think there. Probably a little bit trickier, but I think on my on our program, um, what we focused on really was um, what I sort of what I used to call sort of um, you know creating a cohort of, of leaders, and that was really really important with our stakeholders. So we established really um, a leadership group whereby if there were particular challenges. Um, they all, again, signed up to a similar charter or a similar statement whereby they undertook to, to operate together. Um, and I would say that that has been invaluable, whereby if one particular institution wasn't necessarily taking decisions at, in a timely way or wasn't necessarily walking the talk, um, they wouldn't want to be embarrassed or left behind um, or challenged by some of their peers in that stakeholder community. I think that sort of power, that soft power within that forum was incredibly important and probably my biggest uh, lever with my external environment. No, that's a, it's a brilliant point to make around the, the soft power that we have. And I think we've heard a lot around in all of your presentations around culture um, and how that uh, really is important for us to ensure that we establish a um, positive environment within our workplaces and how that goes beyond um, what we see in our organisation to our ex external um, stakeholders too. Um, and if we're going to be sort of pivoting back um, to the point we earlier made around um, benefits realisation, um, and I know this is a buzzword that we're hearing a lot about, um, and I've heard multiple times SRO say, this is really difficult. How do I, at the top of the food chain, ensure that the business case um, um, benefits are being realised um, for a project, especially when projects span multiple years? How do you see um, the role of the SRO being important or what can the SRO do to ensure that those benefits are realised, especially um, for projects that perhaps have a, a longer um, tenure? And I can perhaps bring that, pick that up with you again, Rosanna. Um, so I think on our programme, the many of the benefits of immediate jobs through the construction um, phase of the program are some of our earlier and more tangible benefits. But you know, how do you um, create life chances for a local community? So um, in our business case, we've got a, a 30 year horizon um, in order to deliver those benefits. But what we have done is we've set up what we think are some sensible milestones and spending a lot of time with our partners now before the doors open in 22 and 2023, um, really embedding these institutions within the local community, establishing programs um, and setting them up today and setting them up for success, um, and whereby they, they will live, um, live across that 30 year horizon in particular, but also in, in theory um, indefinitely. I think reporting against those milestones um, on an annual basis is, is important and holding everyone's feet to the fire um, on that. So we've set up a, a what we call it our strategic objectives and in, 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 as, our, as the, the, the benefits of the programme. So we meet those partners quarterly. Um, they devise a programme, they curate the programme um, and, and they are accountable for, the, for that programme. And we report to government um, on an annual basis, reporting to the programme board and the East Bank board, the mayor, um, and they in turn also report into their institutions. I think these our institutions are really quite um, capable in this space. It's about education. It's what they do. Um, you know, even the the VNA, of course, are are, are a learning and 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 educational institution as are South as well, um, but in but in the dance sphere. So. It's a program that they have track record in, which is helpful. Um, but the piece that um, I think we're all um, 
quite familiar with here, but perhaps uh, some partners are less so. It's around the governance of that, and it's around reg regular reporting and holding people to account. And, and on, on that, that point, now, thank you, Rosanna. And on, on that point of of governance and holding people to account, I, I perhaps I'll revert to um, to Kevin on this. How do you ensure that this is sustained even in uncertain um, times or uh, uncertain um, phases or stages in a, in a project's delivery? We saw in your presentation polls alight um, and various conspiracy theories around 5G, et cetera. How do you ensure that these benefits are, are, are sustained and realized um, in, in what can be quite challenging circumstances and, and environment, delivery environments? Yeah, well, we, we, we've set up the, the team um, uh, within these patches, geographical patches across the UK to ultimately own the enduring uh, uh, build program. So you know, we will build a new network. The people who live in Swindon or Birmingham or Glasgow, the engineers there will will basically receive that network and own it forever, um, and then they will serve the community. So we we really focused in on the outcome, the end game, and given those teams the the power both locally to make decisions, whether it's hiring and firing, you know, the, the, within the teams, uh, we've processes around that. Uh, but also around the information flow and critically how well we are doing as a team in this area. So, you know, it's not just a management thing about checking and, and controlling. It's also about providing data to the engineers so they know how they're performing as a team um, and want to be able to uh, perform better as a team. And then we're seeing that actually play out in competition between patches as well. So there's a, like, almost a positive generative process happening um, that will that is building real, really building momentum now, which I you know, gives me a lot of confidence that this thing will endure well beyond the end of the build phase. That's brilliant. Thank you, Kevin. And we've spoken um, at length around the sort of the practical things that you can put in place to ensure um, benefits are realised and that um, projects are set for success. I'd like to almost pivot a little bit to some of the questions that we've um, been receiving, which are perhaps more philosophical. Um, and I'd, I'd bring those um, forward to um, Fiona first um, to answer. So one of the, the questions that has sort of ranked highly um, on our um, list of questions on Mentimeter are, um, are people born as good leaders or can this be learned? Over to you, Fiona. Uh, so I have a very strong view on this. This is not, you are not born a leader. Mm -hmm. Nobody is born a leader. Um, this is something that you learn as people learn throughout their lives. And, and I think you keep on learning as a leader. I don't think you're ever done. Um, it's something that, you know, you kind of, some people are more comfortable with leadership but equally, I've known people who, who were not, were really quite shy and found that through becoming comfortable with their kind of leadership, they in fact became brilliant leaders. So I think it's about finding a way of leading that works for you, understanding how you work with others, and then that making that work for your project. Uh, and I think, as I've said, you, learn, you keep on learning. I learn something new every day. Brilliant. Thank you, Fiona. And if I can put it to our current SROs, what are those sort of means in which you have learnt um, your leadership or, or what environments or, or what have been the, uh, the places in which you have gained um, understanding on the role of the SRO and what leadership means and within your respective context? And perhaps I'll start with Rosanna. Um, again, it, 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 I completely agree. It, it, you know, you're not born a leader, you do learn. Um, and with experience, you, you certainly um, learn how to do it better. I think I've, I benefited from MPLA. I think that uh, program was incredibly uh, useful for me personally to support, uh, to support my development, particularly on this program. Um, I'll sort of I'll kind of return to the point about in my case the like sort of a cohort of, of of leaders and and sort of by establishing that that was a useful way for me both to build relationships and build trust and I mentioned earlier building goodwill um, you know and people and relationships with people is just so incredibly important um, I wouldn't be afraid of it I wouldn't be afraid of engaging uh, with people um, it's 
it's so important you have to do that um people generally welcome it um we all have different styles you've got some extroverts you've got introverts um and i think you do have to adapt your style to that to to really engage with 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 all of those people but also equally sort of adapt your style to ensure that you can engage whether that be with external parties um or or, or your team as a whole you mentioned the MPLA as a as, as, as a great space for that, and I think that naturally goes back to um, to Fiona re this sort of peer to peer um, platforms that exist to for, to uh, create a space in which SROs can support one another. What are your sort of views, or what would you encourage a new SRO to do to engage in a space where they can learn from um, perhaps SROs who have been doing this for a little while longer than they have? Um, talk to other SROs. I mean, you know, um, in each organization, each department, there will be somebody who knows where the other SROs are, um, find them. Um, and uh, I mean, the MPLA, one of its avowed original intents was to create a community to, that enabled SROs, because it's quite a lonely job being an SRO sometimes. Um, you know, you may be on your own, it's pretty tough. So create an environment where people could feel safe and share their experiences and their challenges and their problems. And that has been a huge part of the kind of learning within MPLA, which has then continued from that. So I think, you know, replicating that outside, just don't be afraid to ask, don't be afraid to talk to others, find a mentor, find a buddy, you know, will all help. And I notice, if I may, um, Gabriella, I also spotted um, in the, the questions and the question about, well, isn't, you know, MPLA is all fine, but is there something between MSP and the MPLA? And, and the answer is yes, there is. Um, there's a thing called the Project Leadership Programme, which was created for leaders or, or people stepping up, up into leadership roles and really learning um, leadership. Uh, that's got over a thousand graduates. Um, and again, a key feature has been putting people in touch and one of the things we're also trying to do is quite a lot of building intergenerational learning between sro's program directors and, and through the chain through to kind of new folk coming in as well through mentoring and buddying so um we're going to talk a lot more and share um uh, that's mm -hmm. my oh, final sort of comment on that one Brilliant. Thank you, Fiona. And, and you're, you're quite right. There are so many things available um, to SROs and to even those who relate to SROs. And I'm sort of cognizant of the time that we have here. We'll, we will only be able to scratch the surface on, on all the nuggets of information. And so a definite encouragement to all SROs, PDs and otherwise to really connect. Um, we, we've mentioned MPLA and, and then other platforms in which that's, it's possible to do so. Um, so definitely encourage um, all to, to engage um, with others um, in this in your what is a very difficult role um, as SRO and just aware of time I probably would like to pose just one last question um, to each of you um, if to, to answer and um, before we wrap up um, this part of the event today uh, and that question is um, if you were to give a brand new SRO one bit of advice what would that advice be and I'll start with Fiona as you already have the mic so my piece of advice would be trust your instincts. I think one of the things I, I thought when I was um, first an SRO was, as I said, I thought my, I thought I needed to be pretty good on applying the Prince Two manual, and and then things were still going wrong. And then I started finding my own ways of doing things. But I thought, well, I'm doing, I'm not doing this properly. And when I went on the MPLA, I realised that actually an awful lot of what I was doing by gut feel was in fact perfectly well founded in reality. So I think, you know, trust your instincts, but also don't be afraid to ask others. Don't be afraid to seek advice and help. Thank you, Fiona. And Rosanna? Um, well, I agree with Fiona's sentiments. I would say um, to believe in yourself. Uh, you know, you, you can do this. Um, you know, from personal experience starting out in sort of 2014, charged with by the mayor of pulling a program together um, with a pretty sort of interesting vision. Um, I didn't know where to start. Um, 
but it but yeah believe in yourself do you engage with your team and spend a lot of time with your team and talking to your team um, and encouraging them to to walk the journey with you fantastic thank you Rosanna and last but definitely not least Kevin um, I, I would say uh, try and spend at least one day a week or the equivalent time speaking to the people doing the work. So the, the team members, the junior project managers, uh, the people actually at the coal face, because you will hear mm -hmm. the truth uh, and nothing but the truth of how your project is going. And um, as I said, you break down that hierarchical power structure that sits underneath you. Um, and if you're down there talking to people, your managers will follow you down there because they, they won't want to be caught out and then you'll get to the truth. Fantastic. Thank you all for your insights through the presentation and through the Q&A. We hope to be able to continue these discussions in the various forums that we've um, mentioned over the course of today. Thank you all. And over to you, Murray, to um, Andy, rather, to <laughs> Andy Murray, to conclude um, today's session. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you very much, Gabrielle. And before I close today, I would just first like to thank you for expertly emceeing uh, proceedings. It's been uh, really well orchestrated, so thank you for that. And also special thanks to our three speakers for bearing their SRO souls. And believe me, it's not easy sort of conveying sort of complex concepts with authenticity uh, when you're staring at that small dot sort of at the top of your, your laptop. Um, thanks also uh, needs to go to Bentley Systems uh, for hosting today, but also for their help in guiding us and our speakers in the art of uh, virtual delivery. I think everyone should agree um, with me that uh, we've been given a very good and fascinating insight today on uh, major project leadership and in particular the life of an SRO. Uh, my takeaways have been um, actually a lot and that's sort of too much to sum up really but, but Fiona you gave us the the history and the progression from you know what worked initially and it did work but actually then needing to move to rather than just defining the role but actually adding in personal accountability and we've seen that with sort of um, the, the uh, addition of sort of SRO appointment letters and so on but then also recognizing the inherent complexities and then the individual attributes that need to go with that to deal with it and your point about um, it being a lonely role and uh, so that's why the Art of Brilliance was sort of for us, by us, uh, for us, by us, rather, with that SRO community. Uh, Kevin, I was fascinated with that concept of self-managed team. And what's really then is that beyond just the delivery of your, your outcomes and the benefits, you're actually doing capability building within you know, a very large project program environment. And your need sort of to overcome that sort of watermelon dashboard issue of sort of looking beyond reports and sensing uh, you know, the project health and performance. Um, Rosanna, fascinating, that's a, it's a program I, I know very well, um, but you were going through the complexities there. But what I made a note of most was your list of sort of talents that you um, brought to the role. And you used terms like diplomacy, bravery, fearless, vulnerability, uh, providing confidence to, to the stakeholders, but at the same time, you know, even though you need to show that resilience, you need to be the chief warrior as to what could come next and, and use a couple of terms there, like with Kevin, uh, about sensing what's going on and uh, also the need to be a fortune teller. Um, that was great, great, great guidance there. Um, and and uh, I think you know, summing up towards the end, you also mentioned about having to build up goodwill um, and that sort of leads us to, to realise it's not something that's done quickly. That takes a lot of effort and, and a lot of um, the hard yards of uh, building up those relationships. So I personally thought today's uh, session was excellent, um, um, but we would really like to hear your feedback. And you can provide that using Menti, uh, the codes you've been using for uh, 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 the Q&A. So I think it's displayed on the screen. Um, our next joint event uh, with the IPA is in December, and we will be exploring uh, the topic of project pace. Um, so look out for more details over the coming weeks regarding that one. Uh, and finally, from me, a reminder of the other events uh, that the Major Projects Association uh, has coming up should be on your screen now. Thank you very much.